All right, the next section in physics deals with Newton's law of universal gravitation. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard the story about uh, Isaac Newton sitting under a tree, Apple Falls, maybe he hits his head, maybe he just goes it on the ground, but he starts thinking about what gravity is. And in his mind, that's because the ball rolling as to determining um, gravitational changes according to position and masses. So he said that force is proportional to the product of the two masses involved. In the case of the apple, it was the apple and the, and the mass of the earth. He also found that, and he did his experimentations, he also found that the force was inversely proportional to the distance between the two objects squared. So if you put that together, force is proportional to m1, m2 over v squared. Now this is called proportionality. So we can change proportionalities over two equations like we did in chem 1 with the gas laws. But when we do that, we change the two equations. When we do that, we have to have a constant to tie the two sides together. That constant in this case is g for gravity or gravitational attraction. And then m1, m2 over v squared. And this is his law of universal gravitation. And this can apply to two objects in a room. This can apply to a person and the Earth, or a planet to the Sun, or a planet with another planet. It's all related. But the amount of push has to take both of these into consideration. So the reason why planets don't go all getting sucked into the Earth, well, two re one of two reasons, is because gravitational attraction is not that great because the d squared is humongous. We're talking um, hundreds of millions of kilometers which is hundreds of billions of meters away from the sun, as opposed to the masses, um, which uh, can also be rather large. But the overall effect is between that and the, uh, the force of the objects going around the sun, the centrifugal force and the tangential uh, linear acceleration or force would have to be uh, are, are going to be working together in a vector form that creates the, the path, the semicircular or the, the uh, elliptical path that the planets take, which we'll talk about later on. So, uh, the first example that I have in the script there deals with uh, a 75 kilogram mass. We have a 125 kilogram mass. And the distance between them is 2.25 meters. And the question is, what is the gravitational attraction between them? Now, if we had a frictionless force, or frictional floor, non-frictional floor, frictionless floor, and you have two objects of these masses, at some point in time, they're going to collide. They're going to come together. Of course, the 75 is going to get closer to the 125 because it's going to be faster um, because of F equals MA. Um, but we also know that it's not going to happen because we have friction. Otherwise, things would be constantly moving. It would be like having ghosts in the house. So we're using this universal law of gravitation to figure out how much force is the traction between these two right here. Well, M1, well for G, we need to know what G is. G, as he calculated, and has been proven to be correct uh, hundreds of years later, is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 a Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. And again, Constant labels are just nonsense because they're just trying to put the two sides together. It's like if you took a, a graph of the uh, product of the masses and the product uh, of the square of the distance, and we would get a straight line out of that, and that straight line would have a slope of this value right here. 
okay? So, find the force, G, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meter squared per kilogram squared times the product of the two masses, M1 and M2, 75 kilograms times 125 kilograms divided by the distance between the two of them squared. That distance, we said, was 2.25 meters. This is where people get screwed up. Here's what we get the square the denominator. Watch out for that. Punch that all into your calculator. And you get 1.24 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons. Not much force. But eventually, they will fly it if it's on a friction surface, which doesn't exist. OK? Example number two. Now we have two 150 gram masses. And if we change this to kilograms, that becomes 150 kilograms. Uh, the force between these two objects is uh, 0 0.450 newtons. And we want to know what is the distance between these two objects. So, now, 0.450 newtons equals g, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared times the masses. We have 2.150 kilograms, so they're going to square over d squared. Now in mathematics, if you have all multiplication over here, you've got your variable in the denominator, or the square of the variable in the denominator for that matter. And then uh, you've got the number over here. These two are going to switch from d squared. It's going to equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newton meter squared per kilogram squared times 150 kilograms quantity squared over 0 0.450 newtons. And then you get rid of the square root, or get, or get rid of the square root, get the square root both sides. And B turns out to be 3.48 times 10 to the negative 6 meters, or 3.48 micrometers. For those of you that are pretty tiny and very dense objects that are going to get close together. Okay, the last one is a bit of a tricky one, but it's, I'll, I'll show you a shortcut after I get through all this. Um, given F1 is 16.6 newtons, and we're trying to find F2. Because we're going to change up the uh, Scenario here. The masses are not given and not needed because they are going to be constants in both equations. I'll show you that in a bit. But they say that the, the second distance uh, is going to be one third the first distance. Okay, so it's going to be three times closer. So V2 is going to be. Uh, a third the distance apart from D1. And we don't know what D1 is, and we don't we will not need it, as you shall see. Uh, so we know that F1 or F in general, let's just go F in general. FG, F in general. Uh, F1, F2 over D squared. And since the masses are not going to change, we're going to ignore those for both F1 and F2. F1 equals G over D1 squared. And technically, I don't really need the G, um, but I'll, uh, I'll come back to that and uh, address that issue here. And F2 is going to be equal to G over D2 squared. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this in right here. Okay? So, that means that F2, I'm going to put this up here, F2 
become G over D1 over 3 y squared. And that's going to be equal to G over D1 squared over 9. Now we have a denominator the denominator. It's going to go to the numerator. So that's going to be to 9G over D1 squared. Now, if I take a look at this right here, G over D1 squared is defined as F1. So that means that this is going to be 9 times G over D1 squared, which is 9 times F1. So that means then that F2 is going to be 9 times 16.6 newtons, which is 149 newtons. Now, did you have to go through all that? No. And, let, and I will explain why. I didn't have to put the G there, but I needed that to use as a reference so you can see where it's going. I could have simply written that F equals 1 over D squared. I'm going to put 1 here and 1 here. Because the G is constant, just like the two masses, and I didn't have to have that. Okay? And that means that F1 times D1 squared equals, and then F2 is equal to 1 over D2 squared. So that would means then that I move that over here, and that's 1, and 1 equals 1, so F2 times D2 squared. So you can use that formula. But even that is more laborious than you really need, because check it out. This is what happens here. Remember that if it's inversely proportional to the square, okay, so if we know that the distance is one third what this was over here, but it's inversely proportional, that squared, that becomes three squared times greater. Let's say it was five times farther apart. So that means then that the difference in the distance now is five times greater, but that reverse to one-fifth for the force squared. So the force is 0.04 times the original force, or one-twenty-fifth. So if it gets five times farther apart, the force of gravity is 1 25th, 1 over 5 squared, of the original force. That's what all that means. Okay? The practice problems? Are at the bottom of your script? Have fun.